episode 21 of the Going for Broke Outdoors podcast, a podcast by an outdoorsman for other outdoorsmen. I'm your host, Jeremy Gillespie. In today's episode, we catch up with Mike Cox. Mike is a successful whitetail hunter from Ontario, Canada. In this episode, Mike and I recap his 2021 whitetail season and how he used parallel trails to set up and kill his buck this year. We compare and contrast hunting in Ontario with the Midwest. We share some stories about getting lost and lessons learned. We get some excellent tips from Mike on his top three takeaways as an experienced and savvy whitetail hunter. And we hear about Mike's top three things to avoid to contribute to more success in the whitetail woods. Finally, we wrap up talking about Mike's goals for the 2022 season. Really enjoyed my conversation with Mike and this episode is jam-packed with wisdom and experience. I hope you guys enjoy. Before we get started, I'd like to give a big shout out to Austin Berlin, who's been a regular supporter of this podcast. Austin, if you're listening, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. If you'd like to support this podcast like Austin, there's a link in the description to make a donation via PayPal. Donations help pay for podcast hosting and website hosting fees to ensure that I can continue to bring you quality content in the future. If you're unable to donate, please consider subscribing on YouTube or leaving a review on your favorite podcast hosting site. If you enjoy this podcast, you can also share it with a friend. Today's podcast is brought to you by Stealth Outdoors at www.stealthoutdoors.com. Visit the Stealth Outdoor Store to outfit your mobile hunting setup with some silencing gear. Hunting seasons are closed just about everywhere and the holidays are over. January and February are my favorite times to take stock of my gear and make upgrades for the upcoming season. If your gear isn't already sporting stealth strips, now's the perfect time to upgrade it. There's not a better product on the market for eliminating unwanted noise. Stealth Outdoors manufactures an incredibly durable product and an excellent value. Designed from the ground up with the mobile hunter in mind, Stealth Outdoors manufactures climbing stick wraps, cam buckle covers, platform cable wraps, and stealth strip rolls for all of your miscellaneous silencing needs. Visit www.stealthoutdoors.com to place your order today. Now, on to the podcast. All right, on the phone today, I got Mike. Mike, how you doing? Good. How are you, Jeremy? Can't complain. So you're our first out of the United States guest and why don't you tell everybody where you're living and and that's one of the things we're going to discuss today is that type of deer hunting. Thanks. Glad to be the first international guest on your podcast. <laughs> Located in Southwest Ontario, 40 minutes outside of Toronto, one of the biggest cities in Canada, North America. I'm sure you guys all know where that is. Yeah, I actually went to school in Detroit and back then you could partake in adult beverages at the age of 19 so we used to go across the border from detroit to windsor and and then try to sneak back without getting in, getting caught or in trouble there yeah i grew up in windsor so you and i probably rub shoulders at some some bar down there <laughs> we may have back in the day may have so mike one of the things i want to talk about today is based on your experience your observations or your perceptions how is hunting the same in canada and specifically in ontario versus what you've seen or what you've experienced in the Midwest, and, and how is it different? I'd say in terms of what's the same, I would have to assume that private access is getting harder and harder to come by, and public lands are getting busier. That's what I would say would be the same. In, in terms of what's different, we've got a much lower deer density here in Ontario than I know you guys do in, in Michigan, and obviously the Midwest for sure. And the other thing that I know you've, you talked about in your, in your Iowa adventures, we don't have almost, I've never seen a squirrel hunter at all anywhere. So I think we've got very little squirrel hunting pressure compared to what I hear you guys deal with. So it sounds like maybe you guys might have a bit more pressure than we do, not just deer hunting, but maybe all, all forms of other hunting. Okay. And then talk to me a little bit more about the density, because that's not something I'm aware of. I guess I just assumed it was similar to Michigan, but what's an average deer per square mile or how often or how many deer you see in a sit? Are you going multiple sets without seeing deer? I think I looked it up one time, the deer population in Michigan versus what it is in Ontario, and you guys had way, way more deer. I don't know the, the number, so don't quote me on that. But what I did notice just from reading a lot of live from the field threads on the beast and other topics where a lot of hunters will say i saw six deer tonight eight deer 12 deer i almost never have sits like that i think the most deer i can see in a sit is maybe two three four uh, if i'm lucky and oftentimes it's only one or two bucks 
So it, it definitely is lower. I, I just don't know the, the numbers. Yeah, it sounds more like what my experience was in the northern lower, the upper peninsula, the, the density starts to get lower the farther north you go. And and that's exactly what it's like up there. I have people that I know, uh, I have a cousin that lives up there and he might go three, four or five sits before he sees a deer at all. So it uh, makes for a different dynamic. I do like it in some regards because it seems like when you do see a buck, you don't have to worry about getting busted by a doe in Michigan so many times. The does come in first and bust you. So it, it does have some advantages, but it's certainly not as entertaining. Very true. Totally agree with you on that. The one other thing that I might add, and again, it's just an observation, just from following guys on the forum talk about like the Michigan DNR or Ohio DNR. The DNRs down there seem very proactive in terms of and very hunter friendly for the most part. And they take feedback from from hunters. Whereas in Ontario, I feel like our, we call it the MNR, the Ministry of Natural Resources, they just seem to be getting cutbacks after cutbacks. So there's never time to really, um, I don't know if you feel like you never hear of like a food plot on public land up here or anything like that. Or if there's a hard winter that they're helping get the deer through the winter, you never hear of anything like that. So who knows? If you guys have a MNR that's proactive and does youth hunts and food plots on public land, be thankful for it because we have we have none of that up here. Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah, that that seems to vary in my experience pretty widely by the states. Some states do a really good job of managing that, and some not not as good or not as good as recycling the you know the revenue back into habitat and stuff. Well, anyways, one of the other things I wanted to talk about, and thanks for that introduction, kind of describing the area you're at and some of the similarities and some of the differences. But one of the things that I've realized, the the more I hunt, the more I think it's important to do two things. And the first one is focus on what you do well. And the second one is experiment a little bit each season to add some new tools to the toolbox. So I'd like you to tell me, what do you think that you're doing really well that contributes to your success? And for people that aren't familiar with you, it seems like every year you're putting down a, a good buck or I don't know, can you shoot more than one? I feel like I've seen you with more than one buck in Canada. So a lot of the areas that I hunt in, I can shoot one buck and then I could either party hunt or I can go to another management area and then some areas offer additional tags. So I think there's a year or two where where I was able to to shoot a second buck. Okay, perfect. And that's what I thought. I thought I'd seen you with two on a few occasions, but it seems like every year at least one. So getting back to the question, what do you think that you're doing really well that contributes to your success? I think there's a couple things that I do and you could apply this to anything in life, but I work really, really hard and I always try and learn and approach things with an open mind. And by working really hard, I mean, before the season starts, I'm already, I already know I'm super dedicated for whitetail hunting. So by the time October 1st rolls around, I've proactively done everything around the house with the family. I've got two small kids and a wife, so I've gotten everything done around the house that needs to be done. My wife's not going to say, I need an oil change or, you know, the grass is going to be cut. If I have to rake leaves after dark because I'm wanting to hunt the first week of October, I'll look like an idiot and I'll rake leaves after dark or do whatever. <laughs> but anything that, uh, that the wife wanted done, if we needed a new freezer, I'm just sort of like making, making something up. But if we needed something, I'm going to get that done in August or September. And then once deer season rolls around, she knows like if friends are doing something October 18th in the evening, I'm probably not going to go there or she can figure out what time the sun goes down and know that I'll probably be an hour late or whatever the case is. So I'm off limits October, November. And that's not to say that I ignore my family at all. Like oftentimes I, that night could be pouring rain and I'm, I'm good to go and do what I, whatever other obligations that, that are there. But I try and just get any other distractions out of the way so I can focus on where I want to be and what I want to be doing, which is deer hunting. If it's October 20th and there's a cold front coming in and regarding always trying to learn, I feel like I'm always trying to interpret deer sign and always ask, why did a deer do this? Why did a deer do that? Whether it's looking at a buck track or visually seeing a deer or reviewing trail camera footage, deer can teach you a ton of information. If you kind of just pay attention to that and just, 
try and figure out what what it is where they were where they were where were they going were they going to a crop field were they moving wind to back things like that yeah so i'm gonna kind of circle on two things that you said there the first one and i hear this time and time again from people that have the opportunity to hunt a lot in the fall and it's having an understanding spouse and that goes both ways and you did a great job illustrating that as getting all that honeydew stuff out of the way before the season starts and putting in extra time. It's not just putting in the time. I think putting in extra time before and after the season and then blocking out whether it's a rain day or a couple of days, whatever in the season to, to make sure you're paying the family some attention goes a long way. I feel like. Yeah. hundred percent. And then the other thing, and this is a great point too, is as hunters, especially now with trail cameras and all the, information that's on the internet people doing observation stands it's like you can get a lot of data but it's what you do with that data and you said you know you're you're looking in asking the questions why it's easy to just look at that stuff and scan the surface and say oh there's a deer here there's a deer there but when you really start thinking about it critically like why like you said why is that deer there why is it doing this and you don't always know the answer at least i don't but you make your best inference and over time you start to see patterns that stuff really pays dividends the longer you hunt i think yeah absolutely it does absolutely so from the pictures that i've seen on the beast it looks like you primarily archery hunt now is that due to some hunting regulations in uh, canada or ontario is there something you prefer about archery hunting are you rifle hunting or shotgun hunting and we just don't see it what's the story there mike so for the most part i love the saltitude uh, that comes with bow hunting and the lower pressure, obviously, than, uh, than when all the gun hunters move in. And just personally, there's nothing better than getting within 10, 20, 30 yards of a buck and, and harvesting that buck with an arrow. So I prefer it 100%. I do gun hunt occasionally, and I do enjoy that. I shotgun hunt. Uh, we, have, we have a bow season here in Ontario, in, in the southern portion of Ontario, which runs from October 1st to December 31st with two weeks one week in november and one week in december and you can you can put in for either one of those weeks but not both so you can you can shotgun hunt in november or muzzle loader hunt in november or shotgun or muzzle loader hunt in december so oftentimes what i do is i'll put in for that november shotgun week which is usually around november 1st to the 7th around that date and if i don't have my buck tag filled by then by bow hunting then I'll hunt with a shotgun, but I hunt the exact same style. Literally, if it was legal to hunt with a bow, I would, I would sell my, my shotgun and just, just use my bow. I'm doing it strictly just to stay legal. Oh, so you're not allowed to use like an inferior weapon. You can't bow hunt during the shotgun season. No. And I know a lot of you guys in in the States, you can wear blaze orange and and hunt with a bow even during the rifle weeks. And I'm jealous, but I, I heard that the Ontario MNR is actually looking into to changing that so you could you could hunt with a bow during those those gun seasons if you're still successful in getting drawn for those gun weeks yeah that's interesting now for residents it sounds like you can pick one or the other is that still a drawing like is there a chance you could get neither or you're always going to get one or the other there's a chance you can you can get one or the other there's a chance you could not even get drawn, but if you look at the historic rates for certain management units, how they how they draw the tags, some of them are 100% success rate, so I've never not gotten drawn. Okay, so it is a drawing, but some areas are, are basically guaranteed. For the sounds of it, yeah. That's interesting. So I guess that's something I wasn't aware of, so I guess the question that's popping into my mind is, what's the hunter pressure like? on the public lands after that week of shotgun does that have a big influence like because that's one of the better parts of the rut right let's say your shotgun ends the seventh seventh to the 20th is still pretty good activity or does that shotgun season in there really diminish the the movement that you're seeing on the public lands i feel like it totally changes how those public land deer are because a lot of these public spots is where you see three four five trucks pulling up and a van full of guys getting out to dog a bush or whatever the case is. So those deer almost become a different animal after that shotgun week. So you're either going to get them way, way further back or in an overlook spot somewhere. Uh, other than that, it's hard to find a deer in daylight after, at least at least from what I see. And then 
things usually settle down a week or two after that, but you definitely got to put a lot more time in to get back onto them after that shotgun week. Yeah, that's Montana's got a really early rifle season. It actually starts in October and goes all the way through the deer rut, so that makes it difficult here. So I've, I've been trying to get my deer here early season, like you said, like the solitude and the deer are on pressure then. And in Michigan, I never had an opportunity to hunt before October 1st. That's the same, uh, sounds like the same as your archery opener in Ontario, right? Is that October 1st? That's right. Yeah, and out here in Montana, the archery season opens the first Saturday in September, and, and it's my experience, one, Montana has way less pressure than Michigan, and two, the early season deer are on a pattern, and they're pretty predictable. So I've had good luck the last two years getting deer in early September. What I like to do is I try and take as much time off that week before that gun week and kind of really focus on that late, late October. That's pretty much some of my favorite time to be to be in the woods. So I try and I try my best to get it done before before that shotgun season. So speaking of late October, it looks like you got your buck in twenty twenty one in either late October or early November. So why don't you tell me a recap of that story on your twenty twenty one buck? And give us some of the details. Perfect. We'll do. Well, I, uh, I ended, up, uh, ended up hunting this buck. Uh, it wasn't after this particular buck in general, but this was at, uh, at a private permission farm that I've got permission on locally. And I ended up shooting um, early November. And by around that time, I kind of switched my focus from from looking for very, very fresh scrapes and bedding. And I shift over to what I one of my favorite methods to hunt is hunting parallel trails and sitting pretty much all day. So I took the day off work. I had to drop my kids off at school around eight thirty, nine a.m. And that happens to be my favorite time to hit the woods, have a have a good breakfast, and be in the stand by eight thirty nine o'clock. And that way you're you're kind of fresh for the whole day. You're not waking up at four a.m. And by the time you know, nine thirty, ten o'clock rolls around, you're freezing or hungry or cold. I find if I go in at nine, I'm just feeling that much better for the entire rest of the day. Bring a, a warm thermos and, and I'm good. And the other advantage to that is this this parallel trail I was hunting. I was hunting farmland terrain, which butted up to a swamp. The the corn had a bit of rolling hill to it and it was a, a cedar swamp with some with some wet, wet, uh, standing water. And, um, if I go in too, too early, the does and the bucks, they could have been in that corn feeding and I I bust my hunt before it even starts. So not only is it better because I can sleep in a little bit or take the kids to school or do whatever other obligations I have, I actually think it's a bit more efficient because I want those does bedded where I scouted the bedding. Uh, I don't want to screw that up and bust them on in on the way in. So there's a method to the madness there. So anyways, the weather that day was high pressure and I just had a good feeling about the day, cold, high pressure. And I feel like it was just one of those November days where, where the rut would be in full swing. And I didn't end up seeing any deer at all, all day. And I was just enjoying my time in the woods. And at around, I texted a good buddy of mine around two, two thirty saying hope to shoot a midday bruiser and I think 3 30 I was standing in my stand just shoulder to the tree and looking in the direction where I expected movement and I thought I heard a stick break but I've been hearing sticks break all day because there's squirrels and whatnot in the woods and this time it just felt like it had a bit of extra weight to it and I just said to myself I'm pretty sure that that was a pretty loud snap and as soon as that thought went through my mind, just I could just see antler stepping out from from in front of a cedar tree there, and I just centered the the crosshairs on the buck. This was the second day of shotgun season, so I ended up shooting this buck at like seven yards with a shotgun. Unfortunately, it couldn't have been with an arrow, but whatever it is, what it is, and smoked the buck right through the heart. He ran maybe fifty, sixty yards and hit a tree. Did a one eighty in the air and then landed on a mound all around standing water like you couldn't you couldn't have asked the buck to get dropped in in a nicer spot or a better spot so that was kind of cool got to watch the whole thing go down 
didn't didn't get the blood trail, which I kind of enjoyed doing, but uh, it worked out awesome the way the way everything played out. Yeah, it sounds like a great hunt, and congratulations again on that. So took away a few items there that I want to go over in a little more detail. People that are regular beast members, they probably already know, but I'm getting a lot of listeners that aren't regular on the forum, and they might be on the Facebook, but not on the forum. So describe a parallel trail. You said you, you like to hunt those. What does that mean to you, and how do you set up on those? Sure. Before I get talking about parallel trails, I highly recommend looking up Stanley, the forum member who posted a lot about parallel trails. I really took a lot of Stanley's info and just used it to, to how I see fit. So a parallel trail, essentially, the way, the way I hunt them is what bucks do to scent check doe tracks coming to and from bedding to food. So the doe trails are going to be running perpendicular to the parallel trail. So for example, if we have a wood lot that runs north to south and we have corn to the east and the wood lot is to the west, if that makes any sense, yep. these does are going to be, these does, let's say they go, they bed in the wood lot on the west and they head out to the corn in the east just to oversimplify things. That buck isn't going to go back and forth, back and forth all over these trails. He's going to conserve his energy and he's going to stay within a few yards of that thick wood lot, not risk going out into the soy field or the corn or whatever food there is. He's going to stay in that cover and he's just going to run north and south with his nose down. And when he picks up that estrus smell from that doe, he's going to follow that to where he needs to go. So he's, he's maybe covering three, four or five miles a day or maybe more, maybe 10 miles, I don't know, sand checking until he finds what he's looking for, but he's doing it in the most efficient manner. So you can really capitalize that if you do your scouting, figure out where the does are bedding, see where the food is and, and set up that way with, with obviously the proper wind. So I'd like to hear your experience on this. And a lot of cornfields have a buffer between the woods or the timber and the corn that, you know, it varies from a foot wide to a tractor path that might be 10, 12, 15 feet wide. So if that's the case and there is some buffer between the timber and the corn, are you setting up right on the edge of the timber? Are you setting up 10 yards, 20 yards, 50 yards into the timber? What's your setup look like on those parallel trails? For some reason, I've set up a bunch of trail cameras facing from the woodlot into the corn and from the woodlot into the woods. And I'm getting a lot more pictures of bucks that stay in those thick woods. And I know there's a lot of guys on the forum because I particularly pay attention to some of these posts that post about those bucks cruising the, the like you said, that gap in between the corn and the woods. And there's, there's a couple spots that I've had a camera up and I've gotten beautiful pictures of daylight bucks using that trail. But for the farms that I hunt now and the spots that I hunt now, I'm seeing them in the thick for some reason. So that's kind of where I set up. Having said that, if I can set up four or five yards in that wood lot and perhaps have a shooting lane to my backside where something comes up in that corn or whatever field it is, then I'll, then I'll set up accordingly. But a lot of times I'm setting up maybe in a corner, like an inside, inside corner, trying to maximize any cutting that corner or just on a, on a north and south woodlot like we have used in that example, I'll just set up right in the forest where I might have a shot to the backside food, but I might not. And I'm focusing on them staying in that thick. The one other thing I think that's important is when you access that parallel trail hunting stand, it's probably a lot better to punch through the field and go right to your stand so you're not walking up or down that corridor like you like or that uh, that gap because if you get your your ground scent on there that buck is going to be gone if he's coming in through that that gap like you call it or that tractor trail so you got to come in directly perpendicular to where you're going to hunt and get right set up yeah that's a great tip and those are the types of tips if you ask me it's certainly easier to walk down that trail 
But if you want to have the higher success on older age class bucks, bushwhacking through the corn, although not fun and certainly takes more effort, that could be the difference. Like you said, keeping your ground scent out of there and catching that deer the first time in or the second time in, whatever, totally by surprise. Yeah, and what I like to do is I keep a hunting journal, and a lot of the times if I find some of these spots, either winter scouting or spring scouting, or I mean, let's face it, a parallel trail, it, it doesn't really require that much scouting. Like you can pick one out on a map and say, I could, I could sit here all day and something should cruise by. But what I like to do is pick my tree and then, but you know, if you're, if you're walking in and the corn's six, seven feet tall, every tree looks the same when you're in that cornfield. So what I like to do is maybe break a branch or like if there's a tree, like I had one tree that I called the Y tree. It just would look like a Y and I made, I made that tree or I think it was that tree. It, it had fallen down since this, but. I either knew to aim for that tree or the tree right next to it that I had those, tr- those two trees kind of prepped that I could put a stand up and I had a clear shooting lane down to where I had to shoot. So you kind of give yourself a target if you're doing that in the off season. So you're not just coming in blind and then you're setting up and all of a sudden you've overshot where you're supposed to be or you're five yards too far to the north or to the south and you're not in as good of a spot as you should have been in. Yeah, that's also another great tip. One other thing I wanted to talk about while we're on this topic, and I know this varies widely across the U.S., what does the understory or the timber look like adjacent to this cornfield? When you say thick, is it pine trees, thick growth, autumn olives, mature timber? What are you dealing with adjacent to these fields that you're setting up on? Cedar, autumn olive, hawthorn, dead or dying ash, fallen ash aspens alders stuff like that the odd oak tree and just to just to speak a little bit more about how thick it is a lot of times what i'll do is like i said if i pick that tree where i know is going to be where i'm potentially aiming to be set up well what i'm going to be shooting into into those 20 or 30 yards where i'm hoping to have my shot i'll go there in the winter time or in the springtime and I'll make that deer want to walk through there. So I'll walk north 40, 50 yards. I'll walk south 40, 50 yards and kind of where it's legal. Like on some of the spots I can hunt, the landowners don't mind if I trim some stuff. I'll just kind of make like, like make like a bit of a parallel trail. <clears throat> and then if there's any down logs that I think that the deer is going to see and be like, oh, I'm just going to go around here and either go further into the woods or whatever. I'll kind of move it so it's it's almost like a like a laneway for him to to want to use, and I don't do that all the time, and it's not necessary. But I find ev- you need to put any, everything you can in your favor to help yourself in these situations. So I don't mind doing that. Yeah, that's also a good tip, and I think habitat guys that are allowed to you know, like I said, in private land where you can make those sort of improvements. A lot of people are doing that or, or taking a strand of fence down or whatever. So I think that's that's a pretty common tactic. And, and to me personally, I don't see anything wrong with that. I mean, maybe some people would argue that's unethical, but I don't think so. It's, it's still a wild animal and, you know, it still has the option to go the complete other way. So don't get me wrong. I'm not putting a path that you could, that anybody would be able to see or even walk through. It's just tiny, tiny, subtle little, little things that I'm getting out of the way just to help my odds. That's all. Yeah, and circling back to more of the beginning of your story, you mentioned sleeping in, not sleeping in, maybe just getting a good night's rest, having your breakfast, and then going out to your stands next to standing corn, which I thought that's a great tip because it seems like corn specifically or any taller crop that's a cover crop, which I always think of corn as the main cover crop, as opposed to soybeans or alfalfa, it seems like the deer in the morning linger in those way longer than they would on alfalfa or soybeans or something so i hadn't put that ever together prior to this but i thought that was a great tip waiting till that nine ten o'clock and my experience too and and maybe you've had similar experiences it seems like during the rut a lot of times you don't see buck movement till 8 30 9 o'clock and it seems like you know nine to one and then like you said they get going early a lot of times 2 33 to the evening seems like the best time so i thought that was interesting Yeah, I'm finding that too, definitely. And then one other thing you mentioned, you said it was a high-pressure day. 
Is that something you're keying in on is the barometric pressure? And if so, what are you looking at there? How are you using that? So a couple of things I look at is barometric pressure relative to what it was today, yesterday, tomorrow. I like to see that barometric pressure rise. And the thing that I that I live by, I use uh, Weather Underground or Wonderground, and I always just use the 10-day calendar. And when that pressure goes up, it's just like a big bar graph, and you could literally circle the two or three days, usually in a week, that have really high pressure. So I look for high pressure, and then if that coincides with a temperature drop, I just find it just really helps to get those bucks on their feet. And usually that's that's the days when, when you can catch them cruising, so especially if it's warm beforehand and then it kind of drops off the temperature and the pressure goes up as well. Those are the two things I like to look at is barometric and, and temperature. Yeah, same. If I had to only pick two variables, that's what it would be. It's probably uh, temperature and pressure in that order. Right. Well, that was a, first of all, Mike, that was a, a great story with a lot of details. Appreciate that. And kind of give some insight into your hunting style. So we talked about your buck from this year. Tell me about the favorite buck you've ever hunted and why it's your favorite. Before we hear about Mike's favorite buck, I want to take a break to mention huntingbeastgear.com. Co-founded by the big buck serial killer himself, Dan Infault, Hunting Beast Gear features state-of-the-art manufacturing techniques, the highest quality materials, and innovative designs that have been engineered, field-tested, and refined to perfection by a group of the best mobile hunters on the planet. Hunting Beast Gear delivers cutting-edge products including Beast Gear climbing sticks with weight reduction holes designed to deliver incredible durability in a lightweight climbing stick. Beast Gear climbing sticks also feature non-staggered inline stacking and double steps, all in a 2.2-pound package, including the fastening strap. Hunting Beast Gear has also released the game-changing Beast Gear Hang-On Tree Stand, designed to be the ultimate hang-on tree stand solution with four years of prototyping, testing, and refinement, the Beast Gear stand features a 16-inch wide by 29-inch long platform and comes in at an incredible 6.8 pounds without compromising strength or durability. The Beast Gear stand is finished with a durable anodized coating and features grade 8 hardware, high-quality Delrin washers, Beast buttons, and adjustment knobs. For more details or to place your order today, head on over to www.huntingbeastgear.com. Now, back to the podcast. Oh, it's a probably funny story. You're going to laugh at me, but... Uh... The favorite buck I shot was probably the proverbial a mile back in a public swamp, whatever. But uh, it's one spot that I found on a map, I would say five, six years ago. And I looked at this spot and I thought, geez, this looks really, really good. I'm, I'm going to go check this thing out in the spring. And I ended up finding a real nice shed the first time I went in there. Saw a lot of um, buck poop, route, cut off... Um, dogwood and, and red brush that you could just see these things were browsing probably all winter in here. So it, I, I found this spot. It was a mix. It's a small high ground bowl a mile back in a cattail swamp. And to get into this bowl of high ground, it's thick pine. And then it opens up into a, like a aspen, little hill of, of aspen and dogwood. And it goes from super thick pine to all of a sudden it's like you're getting more. And then you're in this beautiful white birch and aspen meadow with, with just dogwood underneath. And the deer just seem to love it. So found this spot. And the first time I ended up going in, I think it was around October the 18th. And I went in there and I don't know if it was a huge scrape or if there was a big buck fight, but there was the, the ground was just kind of torn up and I followed a rub line all the way in. And with the 40, 50 minutes before legal light, I shot a really nice buck and I thought, this is great. And I ended up because I was so far back from the truck, I took my stand down. The shot looked good. So I ended up putting my Luminoc um, I looked at the arrow really quick, looked, saw good blood, and then I just put my Luminoc, uh, I kind of like stabbed the arrow into the ground. So when I came back, I would at least have a point of reference as to where to start my search. So anyways, got out of there. By the time I was out of that little, that thick, thick pine wood, it was gray light. It was still gray light. So I got out of there, no problem. Didn't think anything of it. Got back to my truck. 
got water, gutting knife, a couple things. In the meantime, I had hung a camera that because I was going to leave this camera to soak all year long because I, I didn't have, I didn't think, oh, I'm not going to shoot a buck on my first time in, but maybe I could hang a camera and then it'll tell me what wind this spot is good at or when the bucks frequent this spot or whatever the case is. So on my way walking back to my truck, I'm calling a friend of mine who the next morning has an important work meeting and I'm begging him to drive an hour and a half from his house to come help me drag this deer out. And he's saying no, he's saying no. And then I finally convinced him when I was walking back with all my two, all my gunning stuff and, and everything back. I had just told him, I said, I'm going to gut this thing. I'll have it at the field edge. It'll be no big deal. We'll get him back loaded up. And I was downplaying how bad of how far we were and how bad of a situation it would be to get the buck out. But I just, I couldn't do it alone. I'd probably still be back there getting them out. So anyways, I find the buck, got him. And then as I start dragging this deer back, I, I literally totally lost my sense of coordination. I didn't know what way, like the whole time that I was just gutting the deer and then I and, and move the deer. By the time I was dragging him, what I thought would be, um, I forget if it was, I think it was West. I just totally lost my bearings and everything around this, this big bowl looked the exact same. And what I ended up having to do to make a long story short, my, my phone was dying. So I called my buddy and I said, hey, I might not be at that field edge that I promised you I would be and my phone might die. So once you get to the field edge, just start screaming or whistling and then I'll holler back and then hopefully we can connect. But what I ended up having to do, I had my phone on me and I don't have Onyx or I don't have any of those apps. I just kind of use Google, Google Maps. So I just looked up Google Maps and every time I would move like 30 yards, that little blue circle that you're at, like one time I, it would, it would move to the north and I'd make another move back to the deer and instead of moving back uh, west as I said it would go south so it wasn't like it wasn't picking me up exactly where I thought I would get a good bearing if I just like got some energy and dragged the buck 40 yards that it would say okay you're going in the right direction it was just going all over the place so what I had to do was put that luminoc back in the ground go as far away as I could with a flashlight and look back at that luminoc and then finally like kind of pick up my bearings and literally I think by around midnight once I was like halfway into those pines, I caught like a little red, tiny little red light of a distant windmill or farmhouse or something that I'm like, okay, that's the direction I need to be going. And then just as I made it out to the, the field edge, which was just pure muck, my buddy showed up. And then just to go from the field edge all the way back to the truck, I think we were done at three in the morning. But it, it's one of those stories that, that I tell. And I would, I would kill to do that all over again in a different situation. Like it's just one of those, I'm, I'm glad I have that story. And when I look at that Euro mount on my wall, I just, I just love that story because it was, you know, just, just some of those good old memories that you make. Right. Yeah. Oh, a lot of takeaways from that. Sounds like you did very good on your, your e-scouting. So you kind of talked about why that area looked good. It was a change in habitat. It was remote. And you also did a good job explaining why once you got in there in person, you thought it was going to be a good spot. But what were the deer doing in there? Where were they? Where do you think they were bedded? How were they utilizing that area? So one thing I forgot to mention is on my way walking in, there was a, there was like a, I guess you could call it a CRP field or something like that. And I found a bunch of night beds on my way in. And that just gave me a ton of confidence because I figured, okay, these deer are bedding way back there. We're on this little high ground and they're milling around in there. They're bedding at the back of it where it meets the wet swamp and then they come out, feed during the nighttime and then they just go right back in. So I, I think it's a buck staging area, a buck bedding area and then they stage in that dogwood and then when it gets dark, they hit those pines and then end up in the CRP and then go about their way feeding wherever they go in the nighttime. Was there ag in that area, or is that agless area? There, yeah, there is some ag. Like there's, there'd be, there'd be hay fields, corn. There'd be other crops that they would be going to after. But this is probably the most secure spot that they can be. Probably one of the spots where 
I usually put a camera there every year and it's the most, one of the spots where I get the most daylight, daylight pictures of, of deer in all the cameras that I run. One sounds like a good area. And two goes back to having security cover and no human intrusion being the number one, most important factor. Cause it sounds like these deer traveling probably a mile, maybe two miles to get to those egg fields. And is that accurate? Yeah. hundred percent. And then let's talk about getting lost because I don't know if I've talked about getting lost. I've, I've had my own adventures getting lost pretty bad two, maybe three times. So are you doing anything different? Did you break down in bionics? Are you carrying a magnetic compass now, extra batteries? Are you doing anything different or what's the, what's the takeaway from that story for you? So, um, I ended up putting a good, uh, one of my best friends, I ended up putting him on a buck in there in 2019 or the year after I, I shot my buck in there and I forgot my compass. So we dealt with the same thing, but with two people, it was just much easier because one guy could just run up and, and then, you, you know, you can kind of yell back and forth and, and figure out pretty quick if you're heading in the right direction or not. I think we kind of have our bearings now in that way. And, and just for the record, like I'm really good at, at sense of direction. I never get lost. Like I can go down a bunch of County roads and know like if I've never been there before, roughly how to get back or whatever the case is. So it only happens to me in this one spot based off of how it is and half it, you know, I only, I only hunt this spot once or twice a year. So I don't really worry about it too, too much. But now what I do is uh, my good buddy, he doesn't get a lot he doesn't get to go out a lot just because he's got a high demanding job. And I guess since he helped me drag that buck out, then I, I, I'm more than willing to share this spot with him. So usually it's one of the few spots that I'll, I'll go in with a friend and and let him tag team a hunt with me. So that's kind of, we kind of resorted to just uh, both going in one, because it's so far back. And two, if you do shoot something, it's nice to have two people ready to to haul something out of there it's just it's it can't be done on your own you'd have to probably quarter quarter a deer out and get get it out of there which i would happily do but it's kind of fun to once or twice a year hunt with someone else yeah for sure no those those type of areas specifically were the way back it it does lend itself to tag teaming with somebody i shot that deer i shot in iowa this year and that was way back and and i should have quartered it up but i didn't but that would have been the type of area that would have been nice to have a second person and hunt because it was big enough to support two people and then, you know, being whatever it was, I think it was like 1.5 miles from the nearest access, you know, getting a deer out of there was, was not very fun. A lot of marsh grass and deadfall. So that was miserable. Well, when, if I ever draw an Iowa tag, I'll come and hunt with you in Iowa. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. So before we move on from that, I just want to talk briefly about my getting lost experience, which was very similar to yours. Except at this point, I, I hadn't had Onyx yet, which I've had Onyx for the past several years now. I was hunting like a pretty substantial piece of public land back in Michigan, roughly 10,000 acres. And basically, it's just got logging roads through it, and the logging roads are a few miles apart. So I'd been to this area several times, hunted it a few times, and I used to have a Garmin handheld GPS. So I'd been hunting maybe that morning or the day before, had my GPS. And then I think I got my coat wet. It might've rained and I switched coats and I didn't grab my GPS. I knew how to get out there fine in the daylight, got out there, take my stand down, reach in my pocket. And it's already dark, right? Cause I hunt till dark, take my stand down. And I don't know if I'm a mile back, but pretty close. Go to reach in my pocket, no GPS, look at my phone. It's almost dead. Very similar to your story. And also very similar to your story, get on Google Maps, the blue dots moving all over. Every time I go one direction, it's like, same thing, not accurate. (laughs) Starting to get pretty nervous. So it's funny how similar this story is because I called my girlfriend and her dad, because her dad knew this area, he's a pretty regular hunter. And uh, I said, hey, my truck's parked here and I'm lost, right? It's dark. I don't know which way to go. There was no moon. Couldn't see the stars. And I said, find my truck and just start beeping the horn, right? Beep the horn every minute and I'll start walking towards that. Okay, they're going to come. Like literally after that phone call, my phone dies. So I wait a few minutes and then I think I got my bearing. So I start walking. And after like 10 or 15 minutes, I ended up running into this guy and he had a deer camp out there, like an old camper. And I told him, I'm like, hey, I'm lost. Like, sorry to bother you. 
can uh, can you take me back to the main, you know, logging road that runs through here? And he's like, sure. Well, long story short, in only 10 or 15 minutes, I was already like a mile the wrong direction, you know, 90 degrees off where I needed to go. So after that incident, I always carry two forms at a minimum now of navigation. So I've got my phone with Onyx, which I've had issues with Onyx being inaccurate or crashing randomly or if you know it's got a tracking feature the track features crashed on me before so if i'm in a brand new area or big area especially like in the mountains of montana or a real big area i still have a garmin so i'll carry that as well and i always carry a compass now always no matter what and i check that make sure it's in my bag before i leave because getting lost in the dark and this was november and it was cold i mean it was like 18 degrees when i got out of the tree stand so being lost all night out there would i survive probably but it wouldn't have been fun so always a good thing or topic to bring up is be prepared right don't don't rely on just technology and even even you said and i i get lost easy so sounds like you have a good sense of direction but you got lost too it can happen to anybody so just a good uh, public service announcement be prepared stay aware for sure. And I think I, I think I remember you posting about that getting lost story a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. And then I got lost one other time prior to that, but this time I was just talking about was the worst. And given this, like I said, the situation that was real cold that I was in a pretty remote area. I mean, if I would have walked 180 degrees off, it was like five miles to the next road in a bunch of swamp, like <laughs> getting wet in the dark when it's that cold, <laughs> not good. So especially like new pieces of land or big tracks of land, like be extra prepared. I mean, there's spots I hunt out here in Kansas where you couldn't get lost if you tried, you know, there's hardly any timber and it's flat, but there's like the thick swamps or the mountains. It's definitely good to be over prepared. For sure. Moving on from the getting lost. One of the other things that you mentioned in that story was you'd taken a trail camera out there to drop. And that's a good segue into, I wanted to talk about trail camera strategy. So first of all, are you running any trail cameras? Yeah, I'm running about eight. Okay, and are you running conventional, cell, or some combination? All conventional right now. What's your trail camera strategy look like? So what I do is I leave, I would say, I think I've got four or five of them that I use where I just leave them out all year long, and I base those ones on prospecting spots to confirm if my uh, spring and winter scouting was correct. So when I winter scout, I'll probably find a couple areas every year and I'll just think to myself, hmm, I'm going to put a camera here and see if this is a parallel trail or if bucks cruise here or pass through here. And if they do, when is it? Is it all season long? Is it early season, mid season, late season? Is it when a cornfield comes down or what, whatever info I need, I'll try and gather and I'll drop that cam there. For the whole year and then what i've been doing recently just for the last couple of years is some of the local spots that i hunt on my lunch break i kind of call it my trap line on my lunch break i'll bomb around to two farms maybe three if i can if i can swing it and swap some memory cards if the wind is right where i'm not where my scent wouldn't be blowing into where i think the the deer are bedding obviously and they, these are all in non-intrusive spots, so the deer are one either used to the landowner walking through there or a farmer coming through there. And I'm not getting too deep into where I would disturb these, the deer behavior. And I'll just grab these cards and see maybe I can catch a buck coming back to bed, or maybe I saw something that happened the night before and see what if the wind's the same. I can pounce on something. So I'm just looking for opportunities on the cameras that I use almost like a poor, poor man cell camera, I guess, where I'm just behind the eight ball, but I can feel like I could pounce on an info that night if I'm checking at lunch. And then the other ones I just use to prospect for and confirm what my spring and winter scouting is telling me. Okay. So prospecting, that's something I feel like a lot more people are doing and for good reason. So have you had any situations in the past where you've done that, found a buck and then found that buck in the same area next year and, and specifically I'd be interested in seems like people are talking more and more about seasonal timing like bucks that aren't there all year but they'll show up for this day or this week is that anything you've experienced in your area yeah I, I there's there's a few spots where 
I'm having cameras pick up certain bucks on certain dates. It's happened a couple of years in a row. And then what happened last year is that day that I wanted to hunt that certain spot, I think it was like November 3rd or something like that. I got the total opposite wind of, of what I needed. Uh, I think I needed an east wind, which that's a hard wind to, uh, to pray for in, in my area. We don't get it that often. And then there was literally like three weeks where I didn't get an east wind. So I couldn't test my theory if he'd be back again one more year. But I'm definitely seeing bucks coming back to certain spots certain times of the year yeah and then i mean it probably goes without saying you're focused on getting back in those areas during those dates for sure yeah and that's one of those details that again i think this is getting to be more common knowledge but not everybody's heard of it when you're reviewing your trail camera photos especially when you're doing that prospecting stuff super important to to note the dates and the weather conditions and like you said well you didn't get those weather conditions so you didn't go back in there this year but maybe this coming year, you know, if it's not that buck, it could be that buck still, but a buck of similar caliber might be in there again. Yeah. And I've been running a journal since I think 2016 where I run, I've got a different Microsoft Excel tab for every place that I hunt. And I just put wind direction, temperature, um, what I saw, where I saw, what I thought was going on. And then what I do on my, on my phone to, is just kind of take pictures of every every time I go hunting. If I see a scrape that I'm passing, I'll take a picture of that or I'll take a picture of a big track or whatever else I find of value. And then I take a couple pictures up from in my tree stand so I can always relate back based on my journal and then I can relate that back to just scrolling through my phone and being like, oh yeah, I sat there, oh, was was acorns dropping what, what was in that field oh it was corn it was cut on this date because it was in my journal and i just try and accumulate all that info and this might be hijacking the trail camera question but it's just sometimes i don't know what to make sense of that info but i might go back two years from now and say oh yeah i had an encounter the third week in november and it was the day after the corn went down maybe that's why i had it so i'm just trying to gather as much info as i can pretty rudimentary but it's kind of working for me no, I think that's super important, and that's one of the things that I've evolved over the years is to take more detailed notes. And I don't mean, and it sounds like you're not either. You don't have to write a dictionary, encyclopedia size note, but especially for mobile hunters, I think it's super important because, in my experience, it's probably a little bit unique living in Michigan, now moving to Montana, and I've hunted a bunch of states across the U.S., but I might not have been in North Dakota in two or three years and I kind of remember what happened or I kind of remember <laughs> what was there. But if I go into my Onyx waypoints and Onyx has a spot where you can take notes right on the waypoint. If I put the date I was there and I think the Onyx automatically dates your waypoint if you don't delete it, but the conditions, right? What was the weather like? What was the crop that year? And it only takes 30, 40 seconds, two minutes. And you could do that while you're in the tree stand or right after you get out of the hunt to your vehicle. And that stuff's critical because you, I mean, and unless people got photographic memories, which I certainly don't, a couple of years later, you might want that info and, you know, you have a vague idea if you don't take those detailed notes. So note taken, journaling, whatever. Again, it doesn't have to be this huge labor where it's hours every time you go hunting. A little bit of info that's specific goes a long way. Yeah, for sure. You don't need, you don't need to spend 30 minutes doing this. You just need a couple points in terms of, like you said, weather, temperature, what the crop was and what you maybe thought the deer were doing and then what you saw. And that's pretty much that, that, that should give you enough detail over time to kind of make up, um, make up your, your, your thesis on, on what's going on. Yeah, for sure. So if you're not taking notes, you're doing yourself a disservice. Start, start taking some notes, even if it's a couple sentences. Yep. Well, Mike, it's the middle of January right now. So it's kind of the off season. Especially, I imagine, in uh, Canada. Well, maybe not this year. It's been pretty warm. You guys got any snow on the ground right now? A couple inches, that's it. Yeah, we don't have hardly any out here in Montana. It's been a really weird winter. It was actually like 45 degrees here today. But normally, this is kind of the, the slow season. And I don't know, when when do you start your, pre, or your I guess, preseason, postseason, your spring scouting? When do you start that normally? So right now, what I'm doing is... I still have some trail cameras that I've had out since 
probably mid-October, end of October. So I've got to collect a few more trail cameras, get those down. And then, and then I'm going to start going and, and doing my, my spring scouting or postseason scouting real soon. And postseason scouting, I, my thoughts on this have evolved quite a bit over the years, but still think it's important. What are you looking for when you're out postseason scouting to let you know that this is a good area? And as a corollary to that question, what do you notice while you're postseason scouting that makes you think an area might be a great area? So for me, the postseason scouting is super important to me because I do I go and I scout my the spots that I hunt that I've already accumulated just to see if, I don't know, maybe a big tree had fallen and I got to adjust 30, 40, 50 yards and access somewhere just a little bit differently. Or maybe maybe a tree that was in my shooting lane grew and I should maybe break it or whatever, just clear a lane, whatever you got to do there. It's just good to, to get back in there and confirm that that spot is still good or there's not a ladder stand in there or whatever the case is. And it's also really critical to find new spots. So what I need to do is circle areas on maps that I think are good and then maybe I'll get taken off on a tangent but right now is when I kind of make my mind up on some of the new spots I'm going to either try to hunt or hang a camera and decide if it's worth hunting or not and then what I specifically look for in postseason scouting like you asked 100% security cover and hard to access spots Though a combination of those two things I find is what, what I really try and find. Hard to find. You're not going to find it every day. But when you do find it, you know right away. And a lot of times those spots come with habitat diversity. And ideally, they're close to a food source and maybe a little bit of water. Some of the clues that differentiate an area from a great area. Did you ask me that too? Yeah. If you got anything uh, that's sticking out to you over your years of experience that like I said, a lot of times I get into an area and I think, oh, this is a good area. It might kill a buck here. But every once in a while you get into an area and you're like, oh, yeah, this is the area. So when you get into an area and your your spider senses are going off, what is it about that area or what sign or the, how the area is set up? What clues you into like this is going to be a great area? I think a lot of it is like on your way to that spot, you're not seeing rusted out shotgun shells from bird hunters or rabbit hunters on the ground or a water bottle or a wrapper or any of that kind of stuff and you're just getting more and more remote and just the harder they are to get to and the more secure those deer can feel there you just know and you'll see worn down trails deer tracks all over the place stuff like that i think when you when you've been to these spots you know and um, I, i don't know how else i can how else i can explain it but that, that seems to be it. I think this evolves over time as you get more experience as a hunter. If you're a newer hunter and you're listening to this, and eventually you're going to run into a spot where you have some good buck activity. Mike talked about it earlier. Think about why that is. Look at that area. And then something I like to do is, and this has helped my e-scouting tremendously, is I'll go back after the fact and look at that area especially if it was a newer spot that I'd hunted and see what that looks like on the map. How's it set up? What's the area look like from the aerial photos? How's it relate to the food sources? Did I think there was any bedding around there? And then I'll try to find similar areas to go check out on different parcels. Yeah, very good point. And a lot of the times when you're in those spots, you it, something just clicks and you say, oh, that's why that buck is here because the wind is blowing over his back. You could hear a coyote coming if it was coming from from left or right through the wet swamp. And if you or me are coming straight at him, he'll be able to see us. So he, he's pretty much invincible here. So I got to set up around the corner behind a thicket or whatever the case is. But, but you can, you, it's obvious once, once you find some of these spots and it takes a lot of boot rubber and a lot of walking to find them because they're, they're, they're not that many out there. Yeah. That's something I was discussing the other day. I don't know. It might've been a blog, might've been another podcast. I don't remember where I was talking about it, but it seems like for me, and it's been consistent in Michigan and out west too, it's like five to 10 miles probably a walking for every quality, you know, really high odds setup. What's, is that similar to your experience? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe more even. Yeah. Like you said, there's, there's not very many. How many, 
spots have you investigated over spring scouting in your hunting career and, and how many would, would you be real excited to go back to when you think about it like that it's like it's a very small percentage yeah or you think you found a spot and, and you're about ready to pick a tree and then you look up and you see a, a, a hang on or or you know screw in pegs or a ladder stand somewhere and you're you just feel like deflated like a kick in the gut right so that happens too yeah for sure for sure now that i live out west I rely a lot more on in-season scouting than I do post-season scouting. And I think it's a lot tougher to do in timbered areas and swampy terrain, like back where I used to hunt in Michigan. So I'd be curious to know if you're doing any in-season scouting, why or why not? And if you are, what does that look like for you? Sure. So I do quite a bit of in-season scouting, especially from earlier on in October up up until about the rut. Usually around the rut is when I focus on parallel trails or known bedding and and things like that but what i do from around early to mid-october is i'll scout if i can i usually take a half day off work so i'm done at noon that day and i'll usually try and put in three or four hours of boots on the ground scouting so a lot of the spots that i'm going to could be like four or five different public land tracks that I know I want to go to this spot here, this spot and another one, three, three different spots at one other public land tract. And those are all spots that I've kind of circled or put in my mind based off winter scouting. That's confirmed. Yep. I want to check this out. So I won't bust into the spot, but everything's situational obviously. So maybe I'll walk a field edge somewhere. And if I see a big track walking into roughly where I, I, winter scouted then i'll be thinking of how to set up and then hunt that spot and it could be the first spot i find or the last spot i find but i'll usually bring a change of clothes in case i get sweated up and then do a milk run of some of these spots that i found boom 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 and then if i've if i've found any good sign i'll hunt one of those spots that's the most promising or i'm at the point now where i can i've got enough history of either trail camp data or past experience where if if all of those spots are a bust, then I can I can just fall back on on another spot and and hopefully make something happen. And again, it's a lot of walking and a lot of times nothing turns up. But you got to do it because I, I I can't just sit somewhere just to say oh I think I'm going to sit here. I w- I want to be able to say the reason why I'm sitting this stand is because of A B C and that's winter scouting confirmed that with in-season scouting and now there's you know a worn down path going in this way or whatever you know something that that's got me wanting to hunt that spot and a lot of times i don't scout with a stand on my back because i've got a few different spots that i want to go to and i just i just like to go and and walk through those spots and i just think it would just slow me down i wouldn't be able to get that high quality sit if i just had my stand on my back or or bow with me or anything and that burned me last year because i walked up on a really nice chocolate horned eight or ten point buck under an apple tree midday 80 yards off a off a road on public land and i looked at the buck i don't know who was more shocked me or him but that happened to me too one time you didn't have your bow no i didn't oh man so i i just talked about this the other day too because when i went to scout iowa you know, the season was open. It was 22nd, 23rd, quite a few years ago now. I think it was 2015. Yeah, I think it was 2015. So in 2014, I almost shot the biggest buck that I had in Cameron, Michigan. Not that it was a big buck. It was like 110 inches. But it was. It would have been my best Michigan buck at the time. And it came in following a doe. The doe winded me because it was like one of those calm, humid areas where you sent just pools and no wind that day. Anyways, so this deer busted me, and then the following year, my girlfriend's dad shot the deer like second or third day of season, wounded it, and we never found it. And about a mile away, there's some public land, and I was going out to check trail cameras and put trail cameras out, and it was the middle of the day. I didn't take my bow, and long story short, I jumped this buck that I almost killed the year before, and then he'd wounded. He was still alive, and he stood like 20, 30 yards away from me for like 40 seconds not saying I would have killed him, but at least I would have maybe attempted to get an arrow knocked and get a shot off. So 
I never, and I mean never now, if a season is open and I'm scouting, never without my bow ever again. That was early season then too. That that happened to you? Yeah, it was like October 15th. So it was only two weeks into the season. And then in Iowa, I jumped at least three deer that were probably 135 or better with my bow. I didn't get a shot at any of them because, you know, it's like I walked in a thicket and spooked him. And I was more interested in just covering ground, trying to find some areas than I was, you know, being like still hunting, stalking or whatever. Right. So I, I had expected to jump some deer, but one of those deer could have easily stood there. And if I didn't have my bow, I'm sure they would have. So that's just my, and again, there's a lot of PSAs in this uh, podcast today. That's my PSA. Carry extra navigation equipment and always, always have your bow if the season is open. Yeah, the time I had that encounter was, I think, October 12th, and I, I just couldn't believe that that buck would be under an apple tree, you know, 80 yards from the road. I actually snuck back to my truck, got my bow, but when I came back, he was gone. I thought maybe there's a small chance, but it didn't happen. All good. You should have went back without your bow a third time. I bet you he would have been there. I think they know. Yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> All right, well, we talked about postseason scouting in season scouting now i want to talk about tactics so do you have any favorite tactics or strategies that contribute to your success and for example you know something in the early season maybe something non-conventional you know whatever it is do you have something that's worked for you consistently over the the years of your hunting i think i talked about mostly of, of what i do and that's just scouting hard that early mid-October and, and then hunting whatever best sign comes up and then that sitting 8 30 9 a.m till dark pre-rut rut those are probably my two my my two go-to tactics to try and just grind hard like there's no shortcut to that like it, they both require a lot of work either either walking or sitting in the, in the tree but those are pretty much the two tactics that uh, that are my favorite that I like to do. Yeah, and I think maybe you're selling yourself short. I think uh, the early season, especially being adaptable, I mean, it'd be easy just to go sit in the stand early season too, but being adaptable, covering the ground, finding that hot sign early season, that definitely makes a difference. Yeah, and it makes your hunt that much funner too if you know that you're, it's October 15th or 18th and you found a, a really good scrape to sit under of a spot that you already scouted and you came in there on the perfect wind and you're just waiting for that buck to work that scrape before he heads out uh, to look for does or whatever the case is. So I just really enjoy and love even, even that scouting portion of it. I love every, every bit of it. Um, I love it. So it makes it easy. It's time consuming. And yeah, I'd rather just put up a stand and, and, and sit and hunt. But when you got to put in the time and, and scout and scout and try and find a spot to sit then then that's what i do and when you got to sit in a tree and wait for that buck to send check no bedding or whatever the case is then then i enjoy every minute waiting of that too perfect no i appreciate that uh that information so one of the things and kind of getting we're on an hour here so kind of getting towards wrapping up we covered a lot about your approach to hunting and your tactics and obviously those have been accumulated and refined over years of experience and trial and error so if you were to start over today but you knew what you know now give me your top three tips to become a better hunter basically what three things have had the biggest impact on your success over the years record your hunt data put some pics on your phone maybe do a video and if it's winter scouting or in season and just do a quick video and say, this is my kill tree. This is this is a spot a mile back from the road. This is what I think is going to happen. This is why I picked that tree. Pan around and give yourself that whole visual and then replay that before you go in to hunt that spot. That way you know how many sticks to bring in. You know, oh, I, when I sit here, I'm going to have to watch for this branch that's overhanging, whatever the case is. Along with that, keep a journal or a log and just start compiling your, your data. Number two, hunt with an open mind and just, just let those deer tell you what they're going to do. If, if you're finding buck poop and, and night beds out in a field somewhere, that's not being done in the daytime. That's being done at 2 a.m. 
but know that you're on the right path and somewhere near there, there could be a staging area and a bedding area. So just hunt with an open mind and let, let that sign that you might just dismiss because it's a night bed and just say, okay, the deer are telling me they're here at 2 a.m. Where could they be? What's the next hint? What's the next clue? And then just expand on that and just keep an open mind because they might not be betting where you think they are or where that hunting show says that they're always coming from or whatever the, whatever the case is. And then just scout, scout and learn your area and, and learn your deer. Yeah, no shortage or no shortcuts. Scouting, plain and simple, scouting kills deer, right? Scouting kills deer. Yep. Whether that's postseason, in season, accumulated trail camera data, whatever it is, it's like, I mean, you got obviously the hunting aspect too, but to getting in position for the hunt, that's it all revolves around scouting, if you ask me. Yeah. Well, on the opposite side of that coin, we talked about the three things your biggest tips to be successful. What are the three things maybe that you've done in the past that you would definitely avoid now or mistakes you've made? Maybe it's a product or a gadget. What would you say definitely don't do? Give me two or three things there. I wouldn't hunt anywhere without doing my homework, whether that's e-scouting or boots on the ground or, or past knowledge of, of an area. Make sure you, you get your homework done before you just, set up and sit somewhere now if it's just an observation sit that might be a different story but i wouldn't hunt anywhere without without doing some type of work for sure the other thing i would vi- visualize your deer encounters once you get set up in your tree look try and pivot to your left to your right make sure there's not a limb in the way check your shooting lanes make sure everything is clear because you don't want to be doing that when a buck is to your hard right and you got to spin around and and you can't do it what else don't rush and do any sits if you're coming in for an afternoon take your time to get in a lot of times if you're hunting tight to bedding the, that wind dies down right in the afternoon so you might have to wait to use cover noise like maybe a four-wheeler going by or an airplane overhead and just take your time be patient if you have not gotten stealth strips get them because they will save your hunt at least once a season where something out of your control, you got a belt buckle drops back on a stick or something like that. So go in quiet and do what you can to avoid making sound. So get some stealth strips. If you haven't got them, they, they are huge. And then the last tip, I guess, all these spots that the a hunter will accumulate over time, they're not equal. And what I mean by that is some of the public land spots that I hunt, like the one where I got lost in that super far back, you hunt that spot once and then those deer are turned upside down and they're just on a different pattern where I have a couple uh, private farms that I've permission to hunt on and the landowner walks through these farms daily or every other day and these deer are, will just tolerate human pressure that much more and they are almost conditioned to hearing a four-wheeler or hearing his tractor or hearing him walk through the woods or something like that where I can use that to push where I put my trail cameras or revealing spots. And I still hunt only with a portable stand and I never hunt the same tree more than twice, but I can bounce around in there a lot more than I could if I was trying to connect the dots somewhere out way back remote where deer aren't used to pressure and they're going to adapt a lot differently than when they don't associate human scent with danger. So just kind of know which spots are which and where you can push it and where you need to go in for the one and done kind of sit. Man, Mike, so many great tips there. I couldn't agree more with everything you said. One thing specifically, and I I don't hear this mentioned much, but it is a great tip and it's something that I do, and I don't even know if I've talked about it before, but visualize and anticipate scenarios, right? You get in a tree, if you're ground hunting, try to visualize what's going to happen, how you're going to react, when you're going to draw your bow, all that stuff. I mean, athletes do it. People, I think I'm sure I I couldn't cite one right now, but I know there's scientific studies on the power of visualization. And maybe that sounds like new age or hippie stuff, but it really does work. And I think that's one of the best ways or one of the best tactics you can use if you're suffering from buck fever is to visualize that deer coming in what you're going to do when it comes in, you know, visualize anchor and visualize aiming at a spot on the deer, not on the deer 
visualize putting pressure on the release you know that's it's a really powerful tool and not something that i'm sure has been brought up before so great point on that one especially but all, all great points like i said couldn't agree more with everything you said thanks yeah, we're getting ready to, to wrap up here. Got just a couple more questions for you, though. Being that you're an Ontario hunter and a Canadian, you have any plans to hunt the good old U.S. of A. in the future? I do. I'm just waiting on that uh, that invite down to Kansas with you. That's uh, Once that's done, you let me know, and I'll be on my way. All right. Well, that's just around the corner. I think uh, April is the application period. So, All kidding aside, uh, Kansas has been kind of one of my bucket list hunts, and and so has Ohio, just the, those big rolling hills. They just look super in, intimidating to me. And I would almost want to take it as a challenge to, to try and get down there and maybe take a week of, of hunting and, and seeing if I can put it together. Ohio would be maybe like an eight or a 10 hour drive for me. Kansas would be like 18 to 20. So yeah, hopefully in the next couple of years, I'll be able to, to steal a week and just head down there. Yeah, that'd be awesome, man. What's uh I mean, I imagine that's just like a non-resident, right? If you're hunting as a Canadian in the States, is are you aware of anything that's different as far as the applications? Or I mean, maybe now it's weird because of COVID, but assuming COVID's not a thing, you just apply like any other non-resident? I, I think it falls just like a non-resident. So if if I have you call me and pretend you're my boss that I have to go on a week-long business trip, then you know, you'll know I drew a tag. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. So on that same topic, I'm always interested and I'm a, a goal oriented person. I always like to set goals and I always bring this up when I say set goals. I'm not just talking about inches of antler. It could be anything, you know, hunt a new species, hunt a new state, whatever it is. So do you have any goals for the 2022 season? And if you do, do you have any plans in place to accomplish those? Yeah, like my goals, they might be a bit different. Like I put a, a bunch of pressure on myself to succeed, obviously. Like I, try, I get prepped for the season and I want to make sure that, that I harvest a, a nice buck. But I don't have any goals in terms of inches. I just, I, I, and I've said this already in the podcast, I just I just love being in the woods. I love being up in a tree. That's That's my church. That's my therapy. Like it just keeps me going. I love it. So as long as I can connect with with a nice buck and it's an experience where you know i don't want to luck into a into a deer i want to i love being able to say i'm gonna hunt this wood lot with this wind here's why here's how if i can just have those experiences then then i'm going to be super super happy and sure i've got a couple really nice bucks that that i've been kind of chasing on my trail cam i'd love to connect with with one of those next year. But, uh, the other thing that that's going to be more and more of a priority with me is, uh, my 10 year old daughter's really starting to show some interest in hunting. So I'm going to hopefully see if I can get her involved. And she usually comes out a couple times a year, uh, but maybe get her more and more involved in, um, in some, maybe for a, a doe hunt or something like that. We'll see, but those are kind of my goals. Oh, that's awesome. It's, and not everybody lives in a big buck state or whatever. And that doesn't mean you can't have a great time hunting deer, chasing deer and, and making, you know, the hunts your own. I lived in Michigan for a long time and never had any Pope and young deer on camera. Maybe, maybe one time, but I don't think so. And I still had fun every year, right? Like you could still find ways to challenge yourself and to have fun out in the woods. And like you said, just enjoy nature. So it's good to good to stay grounded for sure. Absolutely. Well, Mike, I'd, I'd like to wish you good luck this coming season. And that pretty much wraps up all the questions that I had to discuss with you today. I want to turn it over to you and give you a minute to, if there's anything else you'd like to say in closing or anything you think that's super important that we didn't cover today, go ahead and the floor is yours. Yeah. I mean, I think we covered it both just working hard and scouting and learning your area. That's how you're, that's going to, how are you going to kill those deer? You're going to kill them in the middle of winter when, you could have been watching the NFL or or on the couch and you said, I'm going to go scout. There's good conditions with snow or whatever the case is. And I'm going to, I wanted to go to this public land spot or knock on a door here or there and, and scout some different areas and, and learn new spots. I think that's, that's super important. We already covered on that. 
Um, I think physical fitness and eating healthy is huge. I'm, I'm not an Ironman or anything by, by any means, but I think it's just important to, to eat right and be in half decent shape. So when you're going further back or pushing yourself, and even if you're pushing yourself sitting all day, I try and eat healthy all year so I can eat junk food snacks if, if that's what it's going to take to make me sit all day and not feel too bad about it or not feel physically bad. So I think physical fitness health is important, uh, more so today now than ever with everything going on out there. And um, the one other thing that I do, uh, I guess I can finish with is whenever I'm getting my gear set up and getting ready to hunt, I always say to myself, I wonder what I would say to myself walking back from my hunt that that I wish I would have known right now. Like every time you go into the woods, when you're leaving and walking back to your truck, you've learned something. Either you got winded or, I don't know, you missed an opportunity or something happened. Learn, you can learn something every time. So just ask yourself that every time. What, what did I learn today? What, what, if, if, see, if, if Jeremy got to talk to him, if, if the Jeremy that just finished a hunt could talk to you before your, your hunt started, what could you have done differently? And maybe one out of every three or four times that could have resulted in a kill had you had that one little extra tidbit that you knew when you were walking back to the truck that you didn't know when you were going out for your hunt. So that's kind of what I try and do and just recap, like, what did I learn? What could I have, what could I have done differently? What did I learn? Yeah. And it seems like the more experience you get, you eliminate more and more mistakes and you can't eliminate every mistake or every contingency, you know, things happen, but I've been guilty of it in the past and I'm not ashamed to admit it of being lazy or or making dumb moves that I knew were dumb in doing it. And the older I get, the more I'm, placing a priority on my time and not taking things for granted and like really trying to eliminate those mistakes. I mean, I'm still keeping it fun, but it's like time's limited. Your opportunities limited. The prime of your hunting life and the grand scheme of things is limited. So that's again, great advice. Mike, you had a lot of great advice across this whole podcast and I want to thank you for joining me today. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I wish you the best of luck in the season moving forward. And I hope to have you on again at some point in the future. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thanks for your time, Jeremy. Always a pleasure chatting. All right, man. Well, hey, take care. Thanks. You too.